You imagine for a moment that your final scene of home is the sound of a loud explosion. And your mom comes in and tells you that you need to flee. You had originally planned to stay because your father had been taken by the regime in Syria. And your mom said that we would stay until you found out what happened to him. But he wasn't there. And, uh, and yet the explosion occurs. She, she, she comes in. Um, your last memory is just uh, frantically grabbing some toys that you can from your room before you leave. And then as you, uh, as you exit, you are um, conscious, you are running, you are conscious of barrel bombs dropping, you are conscious of sniper fire, you are conscious of landmines. And with your sisters and mother, you flee, 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 flee to the border. You get across the border, and for a moment you try to breathe a sigh of relief, thinking that this is it, this is safety, this is what you ran and fought for, and now you have made it. But as you cross the border, you realize that on your 12-year-old shoulders sits a responsibility of an adulthood. As the only male in your family, the responsibility sits on you to be the breadwinner, to be the breadwinner for your family. And so at the age of 12, you have to find a job. It's difficult, but you find uh, employment in a uh, uh, car repair shop. And in this car repair shop, uh, the hours are extreme, but the conditions are worse. The hours are, are 12 hours a day seven days a week. It's 30 minutes from your dwelling, and so you have to walk to that place, uh, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. But for you, it isn't the walk and it isn't the hours that are most difficult. It's the conditions, because inside this car repair shop where you work, uh, you are verbally, physically, and also sexually abused. But for every person who violates you, you receive one U.S. dollar more. And when your rent is much higher than the salary that you are getting in this uh, menial task, um, the only thing that you can say is, well, at least it's not happening to my sisters. This is real. This is one life of the over 80 plus million displaced people around the world. This is the, the life of a boy called Karim. When we look around the world today globally at displaced people, sometimes it's easy just to worry about numbers, to worry about jobs, to worry about uh, the allocation of resources. But sometimes we forget to worry about lives. We forget to worry about people. Of the 80 plus million who are displaced, about 26 million of those are what the world would term more refugees. Those are people who have not only left their home, but left their country. Um, and at this moment are unable to return. They are seeking refuge. They are refugees. There's another in the neighborhood of about 45 million people who are internally displaced, which means they are driven from their homes because of, of conflict or other situations, but they have not been driven from their country. So they're within their nation, uh, but they're not within their homes. And so they are, are 45 million called internally displaced. And then you have others that are... Um, Asylum seekers, they are people who need international assistance for a future. And there are about four million of those who are seeking that at this time. And then on top of that, you have the, the situation occurring in Venezuela, where a huge number of, of millions of people have been driven from that nation. Um, and that compromises another four, four and a half million people in need. And so we look at these, these statistics globally, 80 plus million people who are in need. And sometimes we come back and uh, um, our initial response can sometimes be one of, of isolationism or self-defense, saying we need to protect our, our societies and ourselves. And while that is true and that is valid, we also perhaps could consider the resources and abilities and capacity that we have to give. You know, if you look around the world today, 86% of the world's refugees, I'll say it again, 86% of the world's refugees do you know where they're housed? They're housed in developing nations. They're not housed in, in rich and, and wealthy places. They're housed in places where people already have needs. Um, Turkey at this moment has almost four uh, million uh, refugees from Syria who are within their borders. Colombia has uh, almost two million that they are caring for within their borders. And then there's Pakistan and, and Uganda, and they each have over a million um, as, uh, yeah, as, they, as they care for those in need. And the interesting thing, too, is that of those 86% who are in developing nations, over 70% of those people live, the refugees, live in the poorest parts of those developing nations. 
And so when we step back and consider how can we serve, how can we care, one thing that can happen is that we can have a bit of a shift. You know, when you look at places like Colombia, you look at places like uh, Uganda, one of the, the, the shifts that has occurred is this. They are not asking the question, do we have the resources just to assist refugees? What they're saying is, how could this strengthen our nation as a whole? There's a famous tagline that says, uh, refugees bring more than a bundle of belongings to a nation. And the picture is Einstein, because Albert Einstein himself was a refugee. And in a similar way, some of the nations who are adopting a progressive approaches are looking at ways to say, how can we embrace these people as the contributors that they are, that can help strengthen our nation as a whole and our economies as a whole. And I think the other component that uh, would create a radical shift um, is for a moment that of being able to see beyond the statistics and to, to realize in the face of each child, to realize in the face of each mother or, or father or husband or son or daughter that there is someone in need and that you, I, we can be embracing and caring and welcoming um, despite differences, uh, those um, who may be within our borders. And so we look at this world now and we step back and say the crisis is huge, the needs are huge, the plight of these individuals, the pains are real, but there are things we can do personally, societally, nationally, and even as situations change, even financially, we might be in a place not only to help them now, but also to assist them as they endeavor to return home and build their lives again, in many cases, from scratch. Thank you for being a people who care. Thank you for being uh, amongst those who have a desire to change this world. And thank you for looking for ways that you, as you, can help shape this world for those in need. Thank you.